Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. <laughs> this is our Christmas 2017 special episode. Because we are on holidays, it may be a little bit more relaxed than usual, but we still have a lot of great stuff coming up for you today. Yeah, we've got a really delightful interview for you, which we did when we were in Shetland for the Wool Week back in uh, September. You're going to meet Wilma Malcolmson and her granddaughter, Terry. And Wilma is one of Shetland's most successful Fair Isle knitwear designers and producers. Her business goes back 35 years and she has a worldwide customer base. And her granddaughter, not daughter, granddaughter is take, following in her footsteps because she's also designing Fair Isle garments and accessories. So the three of us sat down together and it was really wonderful to hear Wilma and her granddaughter talk really passionately about their shared love of designing Fair Isle and how they come at it from different angles. It was a really lovely interview. New Releases is featuring today with a great hat design from a young Australian designer. And you'll also get to meet Bev from Perth in Scotland as our guest on Knitters of the World. Right now we are in Snowdonia National Park. Um, we have established a family tradition of taking our holidays, our annual holidays, over Christmas and spending them hiking in this beautiful mountainous region. We are really, really happy to be here. We are a little bit sad this year because our daughter is away. She's in Australia spending her Christmas on the other side of the globe. Yeah, but today it's got a really beautiful blue sky. There's hardly any clouds and we've decided to go on this hike, which is a circular route. It's by the village of Bedgellet and it's about a 9k hike, but it's got a really beautiful varied um, uh, uh, scenery, scenery, really. Yeah. yeah. So we'll take you and show you a little bit of that as we go, but I wanted to get my knitting out because it is a knitting podcast. I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> this is your extreme knitting. This is a bit of extreme knitting here. So I am working on the Tegna, which is by uh, Caitlin Hunter. And I talked to, to you about doing it last episode. Well, I have started. This is the, the lace section down the bottom. And now I'm just doing going round and round in sto stocking it. So the lace section was actually pretty easy. But like all lace sections, it looks pretty terrible until you block it. So I won't really get to enjoy it till I've finished it and blocked it. But I'm using uh, Madeleine Tosh. I've never used Mal Madeleine Tosh before. It's the Tosh Mo Light, I think. Yep, that's and right. And I think that's it's 80% merino and 20% kid mohair. So it's kind of a first for me and it's orange. It's not, not green. green. It's not green, <laughs> yes. But I'm, I'm sort of enjoying it. It's very, very easy. So it's a perfect kind of thing to be taking on for extreme knitting. Yep. And you've adjusted that for yourself, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. So I've, uh, I am going to do some changes on this. I'm going to make it more into a wintry garment and change it a little bit so that it suits my body type. Our dog just ran really fast <laughs> after a bird <laughs> right by the stand. <laughs> we were looking very scared. Jack, come here. Good. Okay, but I'm going to tell you more about this detail when we're sitting in a proper sit-down podcast. I just yep. wanted to show it to you. Yep. But what we really love doing, we've done this walk a few times already, and what we really love doing at the end of it is going to this very special cafe and having fantastic scones and jam and clotted cream and English tea. Yeah, the, this, this cafe is really special. The, the uh, scones and clotted cream are some of the best that we've had. And their reputation is obviously widespread, far-reaching, because the cafe is almost full every time we go there. Always full. <laughs> yeah. Well, we always get in. Yeah. But um, the, the other special feature about this cafe is the owner who um, each year, we go there pretty much once a year, each year we come here, and every time we go there, he meets us at the door with a sort of long, drawn face and a complaint about the fact that he's already sold all of the scones that he's made and he's going to have to make another batch or his, I think his wife will be yeah. making another batch. Or the cafe is so full he can only just squeeze us in and it's all quite terrible. We think he's quite an Eeyore character. I'm, I'm curious to hear what he's got to say to us today. Yes, every <laughs> single time without fail. Yep. I think he's the tourist attraction yeah, too. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's, that's one theory of mine that he actually does it because it keeps people coming back to hear what he's got to say. <laughs> We're a little bit further along our hike. It has got a little bit more cloudy, not quite threatening, but it's not as bright as it was before. Uh, some of you have told us that you have some connection to Germany and so you really enjoy seeing the different parts of Germany that we bring you in our extreme netting segments. 
Yeah, and it's Christmas time now and Germany does Christmas really well. They're very famous for their Christmas markets and many of the villages around Germany have got spectacular Christmas markets. They're very old and very famous. And typically the kinds of things you'll find is these very tiny half-timbered houses all festively lit up. There's always an aroma of mulled wine and grilled sausages and gingerbread and roasted chestnuts, chestnuts. yeah, yes. <laughs> wonderful things to eat. And there's also lots of traditional craft products and beautiful wooden toys for children and lovely Christmas decorations. So they're fantastic festive places to go and visit. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to go to one of the more famous um, village Christmas markets to show you before we came here to Snowdonia, but I did get to go to Frankfurt and do a little bit of footage of the Frankfurt Christmas market. So I hope you enjoy it. Sweater Collective. I'm going to chat to you a little bit about my latest hat design, which is called the Dalich hat. I find that increasingly in my knitwear patterns, I'm really inspired by personal experiences and stories. So this hat is named Dulwich because here in Adelaide, there's a suburb called Dulwich and it has a pretty phenomenal bakery. So we used to go there a little bit when I was younger. And there's also a real family connection with us about pastries and baking and sharing what you make with others. So the lattice work cabling in this hat really reminded me of the lattice you get on the top of something like a pie or a tart. So I really wanted to bring all of that together in this design. You start your hat at the bottom here with the brim. You work an alternate cable cast on, which if you haven't done one before, it reminds me a lot of the tubular cast on method but I think it's a really easy technique if you ever find that a bit hard. You work in one by one ribbing. I've used a really short brim on this hat just because I like the look of it, but it's totally customizable. You can make this brim as long or as short as you like. So you can even turn it into a fold over brim if you just work double or a little bit more than double, maybe three times the number of rows of ribbing. You then work a row of increases and then it's straight into this really fun cable pattern. What I love about this pattern is that it's not just cables on a background of reverse stockinette. You have these little windows that alternate between the right side and wrong side of stockinette. And I think that has a really lovely intricate effect. It looks great from a distance and then close up you see all the details that are in it. So I love that. Something else that's really interesting about this cable patterning is the difference in gauge between it and the reverse stockinette top that you have on the hat. So if you're interested, I just thought I'd show you my gauge swatch for this design. 
There's no change in needle size or stitches, but you'll see how much wider the reverse stockinette is compared to the cables. You don't have to worry about that because that's all worked out in the pattern for you. So as you work this final section of cables where these points are, you work invisible decreases. So sometimes you're working a pearl two together in the stockinette section, and sometimes as you work the cable, you're decreasing the stitches as they're being twisted. So you can't see it at all in the end, but it means that the hat is the same size throughout, it's always the same circumference. So then we've got the top. It's got this really cute gathered effect, which is done by a really rapid number of decreases. And then of course, I had to finish my hat off with a pom-pom. You don't have to if you don't want to, it's totally optional, just leave it up if you don't want it. But I'm pretty upset for pom-poms, so I had to put one on mine. Something that's really special about this hat as well is the yarn that's used. I used Karoa fibers, which is an Australian wool. But if that's not available to you, you can really use whatever you like for it. The Karoa Fibres is very close to a sport weight, so similar sport weightish yarns like the Fiber Coat Aran Wool Light and Lana Rara Red Swiss Wool will work really well. If you're using something that's smoother, such as maybe a Merino Superwash yarn, you can actually go up to a DK weight because that will make sure that the cables are filled out really beautifully. This is the largest size, it's being modelled by a male mannequin head, but it actually fits my head really well because I have a large head, so it fits any adult large head. There's a medium size, which is great for a smaller adult head, and then there's a small size, which makes a really great kid's hat, so you can make one for every member of the family. Thank you to Jessica Gore for presenting that lovely uh, Dulwich hat to us. Um, Jessica is from South Australia, lives in Adelaide, Andrea, which is where you studied. It is, it's where I studied. I did a piano performance degree at the Adelaide Conservatorium, it, which is part of the Adelaide Uni, and I totally loved living there. I was there for six years in the early 90s, and it's a great, lovely, relaxed city. It's a small city centre, and it's completely surrounded by some really lovely park lanes. And, as a student, I lived in lots of different places all around the edges, but I always got to walk into uni and back out every day through the parklands, and that was lovely. That's really good. So hello <laughs> to any Adelaideans who are watching. <laughs> Adelaide's got a good spot in my heart. <laughs> yep. Um, Jessica has offered a discount to our patrons on the Dulwich hat pattern. So if you're keen to knit up this beautiful hat, um, you can check it out at Patreon or you can find the link in the YouTube show notes below. So now we're up to the time when we ask you to please become a patron. Some of you have written in and expressed your gratitude that our show is very well thought out and has very good co content and we thank you very much for telling us that and, and giving us that feedback but it really only happens with a tremendous amount of work and planning and there is lots of free entertainment out there but nevertheless this is my full-time occupation I really am working on it every day of the week and, <laughs> and we can only continue if the viewers who like us become patrons um, so that we can keep doing it. So we do ask you, if you've been enjoying lots of our episodes and you would like to enjoy lots more of our episodes, please become a patron. Thank you. Beverly Dot. I live in a small village called Schoon, which is just outside of Perth in Scotland. I moved to Scotland about 20 years ago. I absolutely love it up here. There's such a big sky and lovely light and you tend to find that the colours change depending on the weather and the season and I really love that. I started to knit when I was 11 years old. I was taught by my next door neighbour and I can remember the first garment that I knitted for myself was actually a blue tank top with cables running up the front of it. And I can remember being very proud of it because I used to wear it to secondary school. 
When I'd finished school, I went on to study art and design at college for two years. And when I'd done that, I went on for a further two years to Medway College of Design in Kent, where I studied clothing design technology. And during this time, I can, re be, I, I can remember being very inspired by designers such as Kay Fassett and also Zandra Rhodes. These days, I'm inspired by lots of different designers. Um, I very much like Kate Davies. I do still like Kate Fassett as well. Love Alice Starmore. Um, I'm also a big fan of the Knitsonic process. This was kind of devised by a lady called Felicity Ford. And she has a book out called Knitsonic, the Stranded Colourwork Sourcebook. And it describes how you can take inspiration from everyday objects and turn that into your own stranded colour work. And I have to say that was a bit of a turning point for me in, in terms of, of design. I love playing with colour and my favourite fibre to work with is Shetland wool because I love the way it blooms when it's washed for the first time. But because it's quite a fluffy, sticky fibre, it really lends itself very well to steaking. I find knitting to be very relaxing um, and therapeutic. Um, as a sufferer of a number of long-term conditions, I find that it does help me to relax and it gives me something to focus on and takes my mind off other things. So this is my Melby jumper dress. It was designed by Gudrun Johnston. Um, it was a lovely project, one of those kind of TV watching projects because it's just stocking stitch and stripes in the round for the most part. Um, it was the first project I've knitted that's got little pockets on the front of it. Um, I love the way the sleeves are constructed, the little cap sleeves, you pick up the stitches around the armhole and then you use short row shaping um, to uh, create the actual shape of the sleeve. I like the fact that you can wear it with or without a long sleeve top underneath and, and the length of it is great. Um, I like long jumpers that sort of go down towards the hips and um, so it's great for that as well and I just like the colours of it too. This is my Coldsfoot tunic. Um, it's my own design. It came about after a springtime walk along the River Tay at a place called Stanley Mills which isn't very far away from here. We were walking along the river's edge and there were a lot of mossy rocks and poking up between the mossy rocks were these tiny little bright yellow coltsfoot flowers. And I took lots of photographs with my phone, like I always do. And when I got home, um, I selected a couple of the photos and pulled colours from the photos um, and sort of small areas and use them as ideas to sort of expand on in terms of designs for, for the actual knitted part of the sweater. So this is my scrapbook. I'll show you. This is a close-up photograph, so you can't really see anything, but it's moss um, growing on a rock. And these are the swatches that I came up with. And you can see the one with a little colt's foot down on the bottom that I uh, proceeded to put round the yoke and the sleeves. I'm quite pleased with it. I haven't had a chance to wear it yet, but winter is coming and I'm sure it won't be very long before I get a chance to try it on. So this is my chain link vest by Mary Henderson. I found the pattern in the Knitter magazine quite a while ago. It's actually the first Fair Isle garment that I knitted with steaks. Um, the armhole and v-neck shaping is done as per usual but then you cut your knitting and you fold the edges back and slip stitch them to the inside. I love um, this garment because you can wear it on top of a blouse or a shirt or a t-shirt and it looks great with jeans and I wear jeans all the time. This is my wave cardigan. It was designed by Toshiyuki Shimada and Grace Williamson, and it's from the Knit Real Shetland book again. I loved knitting this. It was knit in the round. It was a very easy stranded pattern for me to remember, and I was able to use up an awful lot of oddments of Shetland wool in different colours that I had. So it was a great stash buster. 
the front opening and the armholes were all steeped and the stitches were picked up around the armhole and knitted towards the wrist with decreases along the way. Um, I've worn it a few times already. I've got a tendency to feel the cold and uh, I'm looking forward to wearing it again lots more this winter. This is Uphelia. This was uh, designed and knitted for the Jameson and Smith Fire Festival cow, which took place earlier this year. All participants had to work with the same colours. There were eight colours in total and you had to work with a minimum of five. Uh, there were also two categories. You could either go for an accessory or um, a garment and you could either design it yourself or use a pattern that you'd seen. I decided to use all eight colours and it took me quite a while to work out how to use them all together. When I first started to knit the sweater, um, the idea was going to be that I would follow this pattern right the way up to the neckline. Um, but once I had knitted the body and the sleeves, I changed my mind and decided that I would do a different yoke. So I set about designing um, a yoke with Vikings and fire on it in the spirit of the Fire Festival cow. Um, took me a while to work out how to do the decreases, but I got there in the end. Uh, and as a result, I was absolutely delighted to win first prize in the garment category. Thanks to Bev for sharing your Fair Isle collection with us on Knitters of the World. We stopped here, Andrea, you chose this little spot yeah, to say hello. Yeah, we did, because of these two gorgeous trees. They're quite spectacular and we wanted to show them to you. They're very beautiful. It's getting quite cold now, so I'm really looking forward to the, the scones and clotted cream. But yeah. we want to really wish you a fantastic Christmas, or if you've already had it, a Happy New Year. Lots of happiness, peace, health, joy, great family and friend relationships, everything you want in life, <laughs> we wish to you. And we hope to see you right through 2018. Yep, thanks for being with us, for keeping us company. We look forward to having your company in 2018. And happy knitting. Happy knitting. Bye. Bye.
welcome. Today I'm in Cunningsboro, which is south of Lerick in Shetland, and I'm really happy today to be joined by Wilma and Terry Malcolmson. Wilma is the owner of Shetland Designer, which is a company that was established in 1982, and they make and produce very beautiful Fair Isle garments and accessories. The company was so successful that they've had export markets around the world, and Everything is made here in Shetland. It's designed by Wilma and they're using Shetland wool. It's it's very interesting story behind it. So we're going to hear about that. And Terry is Wilma's granddaughter. And Terry is a trained audiologist, but she's going to follow in her grandmother's footsteps in as much as that she's going to start her own knitwear, or she has already started her own knitwear design business. So that's very interesting. And the other thing that I recently found out was that the Malcolmson family on both sides can be traced back to the 1600s. So that is such a rich Shetland heritage. So I thought we might start off, Wilma, with you telling us a little bit about your memories from being a child and the knitting that was going on around you. I was the youngest in a family, and so I spent a lot of time with my mother. And I really learned to knit by just being around her. Knitting was a very social thing. Everyone around you was knitting. Yeah. And Ladies would greet other, each other by saying, what are you knitting? <laughs> <laughs> so you said when you started knitting that you um, knitted clothes for your dolls? Yes, I did. And was that granny, my great-granny showed you how to do that, your mum? Well, I think I just played around and didn't do any serious knitting. I was more interested in making things. Putting things together. Putting things together. So so then when you were going out to um, social events, I heard that that's a really, that was often very much accompanied by knitting. Everybody was knitting. Yes, I have such a clear memory of um, visiting friends. Um, I would have been about eight at the time. We walked for about half an hour in the moonlight and when we arrived they were all ready for us. Other people were there. And um, it was so comforting because the sound of the knitting needles yeah. and uh, women were talking. And mm. things being baked, I suppose. Yes. Um, we had our eight o'clocks, which was home bakes and tea, and stayed a bit longer and then walked home. That sounds lovely. Yes. And you said it was, it was about half an hour walk. It was, yes. Yeah. But it would be well worth it. It was well worth it. There was no street lights, so we had the full galaxy of stars. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that sounds beautiful. And um, I heard this expression, tuck, tuck your sock. What's yes. that? Yes, oh, that is, tuck your sock is um, just take your knitting. And whatever you're knitting, it wouldn't be maybe socks. Yeah. <laughs> and we had no electricity at the time, so... Knitting was done by the Tilly lamp, okay. which worked on paraffin, and it really did give a good light, and then we had the peat fire. With the long, dark winters, you really needed that, didn't you? You did. You used it a lot in the winter. That's right, and it was a comforting thing in itself. My mother once told me that if you're ever worried about anything, just tack your sock. <laughs> Um, I think that fact has been well proven over the years. Yes, it has, mm -hmm. scientifically as well. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a child, I never really, I never realised knitting was so important. It was all so comforting and happy. Little did I know that the women's knitting provided the groceries and an odd luxury here and there. Yeah. The craft provided the meat and the vegetables so the knitting was so important yeah. for the other things. Was it hard to sell the knitting? Yes. Many knitters had orders from the Scottish mainland or wherever, but mostly it was sold in the Larwick shops. And it all depended how the buyer was feeling at that time. Maybe your knitting would be rejected. 
So would you get an idea for the shop, what they were looking for? Yes, knitters seemed to have a grapevine where (laughs) everyone knew what was in demand at that time. So they knew what to knit. And some women preferred fair isle and others lace work. But for me, it was always fair isle because of the pattern and colour. Yeah. And with that as well, you had to think ahead, you had to order your colours quite early. Oh, that was so exciting. Um, fleece from the craft was sent to the Scottish mainland uh, to be spun. People had to order their colours in advance. They didn't have the number of colours we enjoy today. So I can still remember... Um, Fawn, natural fawn, bony blue, tartan green, wheat, lemon, red and white (laughs) was always on top of the order. And it would take a few weeks for your bag to come and it was so exciting to get this bag of wool. And you've said before that it was still quite a community thing getting your wool because if if yours were taking a bit longer to come then you might borrow from your neighbour. That's true. Yeah. That us would borrow from someone else. They always knew who who's young was going to come yes, in quicker. Come in quicker. So there again, it was a social thing. Yes, definitely. Very cooperative yes. between you all. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, there didn't seem to be any competition. Well, that might as well show how vital it all was. Everybody knew it was so important. Yeah. That's true. You were willing true. to help each other. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you had some of the the women, before they got married and settled down, went over to the mainland and um, worked. And I think your, did your mother or your aunt do that? Yes, um, we have a studio photo of my mother and my aunt. They went (coughs) off to Edinburgh to work in as servants in houses. And um, they knitted all the time, of course, and my mother originally went to look after the children, but then she was asked to be table maid. Quite an honour. Yes, that was an (laughs) honour. And um, when visitors would come, she was very often asked to come upstairs to demonstrate Shetland Fair Isle in the knitting belt. Really? And it's so strange, (laughs) all those years later, I'm doing the same. Yes, you are, aren't you? <laughs> so in the photo um, that we have of them, they're wearing the jumpers that they knitted, they hand-knitted. Yes, their mother sent them natural colours and they knitted Fair Isles. It just shows how timeless Fair Isle knitting is because they could walk out on the street today and not look out of place. Mm-hmm. Actually, they would look very stylish. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they were very stylish, stylish so women. So they were still knitting with their home fleece? Yes. Because it would be sent to the mainland to be spun, sent back home, and then they would sp- send them... Their own croft yarn yeah. to knit yes. up. And studio photos are so common from that era because people working in the South couldn't afford to come home very often, so they sent this beautiful photography yeah mm-hmm. it's lovely well thank you for sharing those memories oh yes it puts shivers down my back as I just <laughs> think about walking in the moonlight and going and sitting by a peat <laughs> fire and eating home bakes and clicking with the needles <laughs> that sounds perfect yes that yeah. was just so normal for yeah. that time so Wilma when you were around 19 or 20 I think you first became interested in machine knitting so we want to hear what happened before that and how you got into that and after that you started to employ people and your business grew it was very successful and you had a lot of overseas markets and exports and and um, particularly japan Mm -hmm. i think so we'll hear a bit about that but start off with telling us about machine knitting how did that happen well i continued knitting um by hand and especially fair isle sweaters cardigans and um when I was working in Larwick, I became more interested in machine knitting, which was very popular. Fortunately, I married into a family of very good machine knitters, and they um, taught me the basics. And the first machines, were they capable of doing everything or only simple plain knitting? We just did plain knitting on the machines, and um, 
because that was the demand at that time. Okay. And then in 1977, the machine capable of doing Fair Isle, I got that machine then. Okay. It was wonderful for me after knitting by hand to get this machine that could do it quicker. Yeah. You say a lot that it's a, it was a green light for you, really. Absolutely, it was a green light for me. My designs, I had more demand than I could manage. So I started employing friends, mm -hmm. and from there um, a few of us decided to go to a trade fair. We were surprised at the interest in our knitting by companies. So Shetland Designer was born. Mm -hmm. We had to make it more formal. We had the Knitwear Trades Association okay. in 1982, and they supported the knitting industry. It was at the time when oil had arrived and this association supported the indigenous industries. Everything progressed from there. And your colour predictions as well, they arranged... Was it then that... That's true. Um, when going to trade fairs, it was so important to know the colours. So representatives from the colour prediction companies would give a presentation in Shetland. And so we were up to date with... Our fashionable Fashionable colours, which was so important. Yeah. And that was organised by the association, it wasn't was, it? It so was, yes. They helped so much, so much with every aspect. aspect. Really. But now... I have so many patterns and colours, I don't <laughs> need to... You don't follow. need advisors. <laughs> and I think I'm enjoying the art forum now. Yes, well, we'd love to see some of your designing, um, some of the concepts, because you also really love to teach. And um, so you have a, not a lot of um, experience in sharing your knowledge and passing it on. So it'd be interesting to see how you go from inspiration into forming a pattern. Well, I make, I decide on my colours, usually <clears throat> now from a picture or a dish or whatever, try to find the colours and I use Jemison's wool and then I make a lot of swatches until I'm happy with the result. I have a few examples here. Terry suggests that I use my Highland Stoneware plate for inspiration for this wool week. So this is the pattern. You can see the colours here which is used. So you can see the effect of the fish scales and the red spots and this piece. It's always fun to do a swatch from a picture. It can be quite frustrating when you can't find the correct colour you're looking for. But this is the finished the finished piece of this one. So you did quite a lot of swatching before you got to this stage, didn't you? I always do a lot of swatches. Mm -hmm. No one wants to make swatches, but it's so necessary to make sure you're going to be happy with the finished finished look of the pattern. It's really quite interesting to make your swatch and be happy with your colours, with the results, and then change your background colour, your main colour, which when making a garment can make a whole different look. Mm -hmm. So you can see that this is the same and it's got all different main colours or different seed stitch on the top and bottom and it makes such a difference. I think everybody that comes in says which one they would prefer. That's true. So if there, this was a jumper, then this would be your cuff or your neck. Yes. And it can really change the overall look in it mm. quite dramatically. It does. This was just a walk on the beach last summer, and um, I've used the colours from the photo. I just picked out the colours um, to make the patterns, and then... Once I once I was happy with this, I decided to try another pattern, which is a very good idea when you're making a variety of things. This has been used for classes, 
and people mostly cho choose this one because it looks simpler in some way but this one is no more difficult it's just that there's an intense area of colour in it. Yeah, so maybe just because here you've you've said before that you've focused on the kind of outside of the picture and then here is inside, so maybe yes. the change in the background makes it look a bit more intimidating. This area yeah. is more intense for this piece. Mm -hmm. But it's funny how students always seem to go for this, it's for the, the brave easiest, one. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is the this is what the students made would have been making. Yes, that's my class. Is mm -hmm. um, a piece of fair islet which is doable in the time we have, but they can either finish it off as a phone cover or they can keep it as a swatch so that they can keep trying different patterns. Mm -hmm. This is a painting by Vermeer, the Dutch artist, which is one of my favourites. I decided this year for the Wool Week Annual to make a cushion using the colours from this picture and I chose this pattern which is slightly reminiscent of Dutch tiles and then um, I decided to use the picture again to make another another swatch using a different pattern again. And you've said with this one that is actually in the annual, you designed that how long ago? <laughs> the pattern, the actual design, I designed 40 years ago <laughs> and have only really used it now. So this just shows that she keeps everything. Everything <laughs> is kept. <laughs> and it comes back and she uses it again because um, you would not have been thinking about doing anything like this at that time. Absolutely. And I was just, just playing around. It was very exciting when you pulled that one out and thought, said, I think I'll use this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this year I was on a visit to Orkney and particularly liked this picture by an Orkney artist. So have used this section of the picture to show the standing stones and the general landscape of Orkney. In designing this one, uh, you can see the dark brown, which is on this standing stone, and then the rusts is this colour, and the yellows and the green of the grass. When designing a fair isle piece, I do try to keep it balanced. So you can see how I've changed the background. This is a light colored pattern on a dark background. Here I've changed to the lighter colors with a dark pattern. And I think this contributes to a easy flowing pattern. I think um, People expect to find rich, dark colours among my colourways. This is the kind of thing I've done for so long. It's only recently that I've started doing this kind of thing, a different style. It's just a bit lighter and a bit... It is, it's yeah. lighter and maybe more definite. Wilma, I personally really love your work. It was interesting to walk, work around the workshop and see the beautiful designs. I can totally see why you've been so successful. And I want to thank you, for first of all, for your time on the podcast, but also for everything that you've done to keep this tradition alive and, and, um, and the skill set going. I think it's so important. I achieved my skills by the... All the knitters now who um, contentedly knitted away and happily kept the skills alive. And it's so important now to share what we know. We have the Piri Makers in the schools. Um, knitting is no longer in the curriculum at the schools. So volunteers go in to teach the children which is so worthwhile. Absolutely.
And Terry is here learning from your experience, and that's wonderful. And Terry, you've got into your own designing business. What excites you there? Um, I think now that I've I got past the stage of the learning and all the technical things, I'm really enjoying being able to make things my own and put my own spin on things. I've grown up around this, so I think you can see some connections between my work and Granny's work. Um, but it's really exciting having a little bit of background and be able to play around with things and find out more for myself. Um, it's really good just to sit and work it all out for myself as well as taking in everything that's around me. I'm so lucky to be in Shetland. I think too your work is moving on because knitwear has to evolve in time and Possibly, there's yeah. new styles mixed in with the old. Yeah, I like to keep the um, maybe the set of rules, I like to test the rules a little bit but there is certainly um, some guidelines around what makes a traditional Shetland garment pattern, um, things like that. So I like to keep those in mind and um, but you're still keeping it very organic, aren't you? You're growing in an organic way, which is how Shetland knitting was. There weren't any real rules. People just worked with what they had yeah. and developed it naturally, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think every Shetland knitter you talk to may tell you a different set of rules, but mm -hmm. in the end it's all the same. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at some of your um, designs that you've done. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so my design process is, I think, a little bit different from Granny's one. I, I'm probably quite an impatient knitter. I like to see things come as quickly as possible. So what I'll do is I'll start with maybe um, my background colours and I'll make these wraps. So I'll wrap my background colours around a piece of cardboard in the order that I want them in and then my foreground colours, I'll wrap that on top with how whatever many rows there's going to be. So here in this one, you can see there's only one row of orange, so I've got one um, piece of yarn wrapping around there. And that gives me a real sense of what it might look like in the end before I start knitting my swatches. Swatches are certainly very important. Um, I would never get away with not doing a swatch, I don't think. <laughs> So I'll make my wrap and then after that, after I've decided my colours, I will then choose a pattern. So I think you choose a pattern first. Yes, to, I do. Yeah. So I'm a bit the other way. I just like to get the colour sorted out in my head. Um, usually before I start with a colourway, then I'll have an idea of what I want it to look like. So some of mine are based on pictures. You can see here, this is photography by Ivan Hawick, who's a Shetland photographer. And he does a lot of Northern Lights um, or Merry Dancer pictures. So these are based on the pictures here. So this one is my Billister Lights and this one is my Girlster Lights. So it's two places in Shetland where the picture is taken. And I've kind of taken the picture and translated it um, into the Fair Isle. So if there's a little bit of colour in the picture, there's a little bit of colour in my Fair Isle. But that's only one example. In other cases, I've maybe had a person in mind, whoever's ordering the um, jumper it usually is, they'll uh, tell me what kind of colours they want and I'll look at them and what might suit them and what they normally wear and get a real sense of their personal style before I would make up the garment. So it can be different for each one and all my colourways at the moment have got their own little story. I've maybe not had the pressure that you had of having to think something up quickly depending on the predictions I've been able to take my time so far and have a real reason for every colourway that I've got. So this one in particular um, was made for a person. So they'd noticed I hadn't used reds in anything else that I um, had made. This is actually my boyfriend. I think he was just trying to test me to see how, how much I could do. <laughs> so he said, I might want a red jumper for Christmas. So there I went. I really wasn't sure about it, but I really, he's quite a, he's a person that likes wearing colour, but it, he doesn't want it to stand out too much. So this, you can clearly see, it's a red and grey jumper, um, but it's not too kind of in your face as maybe the orange was in the previous one. Um, and in my sketchbook here, I've just got my wrap again, same thing that I did, and some works in progress, as well as some other finished things that I've done with the colourway. And this is really good. I can show these to any visitors that come and want to see my work. 
and I've also got spaces where I can add other things later if I want to. I'm hoping to continually build on everything that I'm doing. So it's a really exciting book, this one, but I think very soon it won't be able to close. <laughs> So this page is different again. This was actually a commission for a wedding. So the bride had decided um, on her bridesmaid's dresses and she's quite a crafty person herself so she was having a piece of yarn on her invitations. So I got the colour of the yarn that was on her invitation and the bridesmaid's dresses hadn't come yet so I actually had just had to look on the website of what they were going to be. Um, so that was kind of my basis. She gave me some ideas of what else, what other decorations she was going to have, and I just had to go for it. So this was three um, sleeveless pullovers for the page boys. You can see one of the page boys here. And I just tried to keep it simple, a nice wedding. I've got here what the hall looked like on the day. Um, so thankfully it does match in. It was quite a lot of pressure for me because this was just really when I was really getting going, really trying to focus on what I was doing. And the picture of the bridesmaid's dresses that I saw on the website actually looked, they looked more like the blue colour on the website, but they came this green colour. So that was lucky that I still had that included um, in my design. So it's very, it's very simple because it was going to be younger people wearing it. Um, and just the little bits of colour while not taking too much um, attention, I suppose. You wanted it to be, you could see that um, it was a piece of fair isle and it's very um, contrasting, but we didn't want it to take over from everything else that the bride had planned. So there's a lot to consider here. And this was the design of a cushion I made for them to keep afterwards so that they had something of the fair isle to keep for themselves. So that was really exciting. That was really fascinating to see your process and I can see that um, this scrapbook is really going to be a bit like Wilma's wall of swatches for you. It'll be a collection of, of things that you'll be able to keep referring back to. Yes, definitely. It's, there's all kind of a bit of a portfolio. Yeah, and you've definitely got the jeans coming down. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great. So if people are interested in your work, they go to your website, is that right? Yes, there's a lot of information on my website and I have a monthly blog as well that you can subscribe to. You've got a beautiful website. How did that, did you do it all yourself? Yeah, so I just did um, all the research myself. I'm quite proud of it um, that I got it all done. Um, it's not something that I've looked into before. So being able to do it all myself was a real achievement for me. It is. I can absolutely second that. <laughs> it's hard work to sit down and find out how to do it. But well done. You've done a great job. Thank you. And I want to thank both of you for giving me your time to come and be on the podcast. And it has been a real privilege to meet you, to hear about the history of the Shetland knitting, to see your beautiful designs and to see how it's developed and to see the future <laughs> with, with Terry's work. So thank you very much. And um, we'll say goodbye now to the viewers. Bye. Bye. Bye.
brown bird.